Welcome to May Second Sunday. We are great. Our theme today is bluebirds uh, and tree swallows. And our presenter will be Leo Holine, whom you will meet in a moment. We are very grateful for Friends of Great Swamp and the Marta Heflin Foundation, who supports these Second Sunday programs. I will now turn this program over um, to Tom Gula, our friend's president, to introduce our presenter. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to introduce Leo Holine, who is going to tell you everything you possibly ever wanted to know about bluebirds, tree swallows, and whatever else comes to mind. So, Leo. Uh, thank you, Tom and Kathy. Uh, it's a pleasure to start these uh, second Sundays again. It used to be that I did it every other Mother's Day, but uh, the pandemic has uh, interrupted those uh, things as well as many others in our lives. Now we have this uh, virtual plus in-person presentation. Uh, that being said, happy Mother's Day to all those who uh, are mothers. And Tom, get me to my slides. Okay. Okay, I assume that those are virtual, have one slide all about bluebirds and tree swallows. Uh, the people that are present here also have the advantage of seeing what's coming next. <laughs> we couldn't get rid of that for some reason. Okay, on this first slide, we, we see the two bird species that most frequently use our boxes in the swamp. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, we have the bluebirds. The female is on top carrying some food for the young. You can tell she's a female, she has the white eye ring and more of a grayish hair. And at the hole, at the nest hole is the male who is more attractive, which is true in most species. <laughs> and and uh, he's, after he's finished, the female will come down. On the left-hand side, we have the tree swallows. Uh, when they are fully adult, tree swallows have the same plumage, male and female. However, uh, they're sort of unique in that the female only requires the adult plumage in her second year. So the bird at the nest hole is a female first year and the male is on top. Why do we provide nest boxes? Why can't these guys take care of themselves? Well, once again, human interactions has uh, presented a problem here. Uh, these are secondary cavity nesters. They don't build their own uh, hole in, in, in a tree. Woodpeckers, primary cavity nesters, have their own ability, tend to only use their hole one year, so the next year a tree swallow or a bluebird could use it. Historically, these are old holes from natural or from, or from woodpeckers were abundant, but in modern times, we don't believe in leaving dead trees stand and deforestation has removed a, a lot of uh, possible nesting sites. Add to that the introduction of non-native uh, cavity species like house sparrows and, and, and starlings increased competition for these nest sites. As a result, at the middle of last century, bluebirds were in a significant decline and uh, the public uh, stepped in to help the situation. I'd like to give a little history of the bluebird trail right here in the Great Swamp. The initial boxes were installed by Boy Scouts or those who can become Eagle Scouts from about the late 60s to the late 70s. Uh, a lot has been learned now as to how to uh, uh, situate these boxes and how they should be designed. Uh, these were poor box designs. They had different hole sizes so that starlings could get into them. Starlings can't get into the one and a half inch diameter hole, which we now have in the boxes. The locations were not productive. You don't put these things on a tree. You got to put them out in the open field. Then the uh, staff of the Great Swamp took over. And they're all, always anxious to work with uh, animals that are in decline. And they, they uh, led a well-documented effort. Uh, they standardized the box, post, and predator guards. Unfortunately, uh, the 
posts were made out of wood and uh, four by four inches and had metal, uh, metal predator guards. Mice are remarkably able to get through the smallest hole between those predator guards and the holes. So when the, uh, it was unusual to have like 25% of the boxes with mice in, in, in the spring. They also put the boxes 100 yards apart, which if you read a book says they can do that, but those are under perfect conditions. Here at the swamp, uh, bluebirds require more land uh, because there's few uh, open meadows and grasslands. The refuge abandoned this effort due to the cost benefit analysis as they saw it. And there's a period of benign neglect using uh, a word that was uh, minted by one of our congressmen or senators, Daniel Patrick Monahan. Of course, he was referring to people, not birds. So from 1987 to 2000, uh, there's very little documentation. Uh, there are some data. Uh, the data are kind of questionable. One year, they claimed that there were 300 bluebird eggs laid, all the eggs hatched, and all the hatchlings fledged. Well, this is going to happen, I can assure you. So the Friends of the Great Swamp were given the responsibility for the trail in 2001. The volunteers now maintain, monitor, document, and really fund, uh, fund any efforts that's required in the program. Okay. That's what we're going to talk most about. Here's an example of a cavity nesting flicker. That's a female flicker feeding their three young, and that's a hole that they made in a, a, a tree. And the Great Swamp is an unusual, not the best situation for bluebirds. Uh, we have a lot of water and a lot of water attract uh, tree swallows. Tree swallows and bluebirds uh, will use the same box, the same nest hole. And if there's only one box, uh, there's a competition between them. The tree swallows tend to get most of them because they don't come in pairs. You have five or six tree swallows. Bluebirds only, only, uh, only a uh, seek a box with a pair. So in the best of worlds, we're having two boxes here. One will have bluebirds, the other will have free swallows. And that happens about 60% of the time in the swamp. This site, by the way, is the old uh, Harding Township uh, Municipal Dump. There was metal in there. So it, the uh, area has been reclaimed. Reclamation means that you gather all of the stuff that was in there. Uh, you put a lot of lime and cement on it. Uh, you put a clay, clay bottom in the bottom, you put the stuff back in the hole, you cover it with clay, and you put a plastic barrier over it, and you put wells around the circular so that you measure that uh, if there's any water that does get in, you can see whether metal contaminants are leaking into the, into the swamp. That's the reason these things are on buckets, because you can't just put a post in here because you make a hole in that plastic uh, liner and water could get in. One of the things that the friends did is realize that if you have both tree swallows and bluebirds, you need uh, two boxes. And this illustrates the data. If you see the green line, um, that's the percent of boxes that are paired. And you can see in 2001, about a fifth were paired. And by 2004 or five, all of them were paired. And you see what this happens is that the tree swallows are happy with one pair and don't have to fight the bluebirds. So their occupation of, uh, of this goes on and the bluebirds have a three shot at the other box. And you wind up with, in this particular set of data, about 50-50 is where we want to be. Take care of the bluebirds as well as making the tree swallows at home so they don't interfere with the bluebirds. As I mentioned, bluebirds require a specific habit, habitat these are birds of open areas and fields. They prefer to forage on the ground. Uh, Cornell University has a famous ornithology lab and they've studied the nesting habitats. Surprisingly, golf courses were the best habitat for bluebirds. Short grass, scattered trees and water. And these benefits outweigh the chemical use. I mean, golf course uses more pesticide, herbicide and fertilizer than anybody else. Please don't tell this to my neighbors, 
I've convinced them that my rather heterogeneous lawn is best for the wildlife. And uh, they would probably argue if they knew this uh, data. Okay, bluebirds typically lay four to five eggs in a well-manufactured uh, straw nest, no feathers, nothing else. Uh, and of course, this raises the question is why does a bird which nests in a dark hole go to the trouble of making the eggs blue? Uh, there are several theories on this. One really doesn't apply to bluebirds in that if a female lays bright blue eggs, it indicates to the male that she's very healthy and he should continue uh, helping and breeding young. I believe the true reason is that bluebirds are uh, related to the thrushes, robins, other, other thrushes which have blue eggs and have open nests, which are in a bush or a tree or what have you. And bluebirds started that way and somehow they evolved into being cavity nesters and they took the blue with them. Aha. Uh -huh. And so it happens that about 2% of the bluebird eggs are white. Uh, this is a gene that's carried by the female. Uh, she does, can't make blue eggs. These eggs are just as likely to uh, fledge as the blue ones. And it's a way of uh, learning that bluebirds have some nest box fidelity, you know, they come to the same nest box every year. So if you have a nest that has white eggs, like cougar eggs, it's very likely that for two or three years, the eggs will also be white until the female passes. Someone would ask me if, uh, have you ever found a nest which has both blue and white eggs? No. Uh, I guess that's a remote possibility, but you'd have to have two females, one which weighs white, white eggs and one which weighs blue eggs. There are nests that do have different eggs from different, uh, different species. Uh, the case here is evidently a bluebird laid that blue egg and uh, abandoned it for whatever reason. The tree swallows came in and laid their three white eggs and added their feathers, which is typical of their nest. They lay eggs in other ducks' nests. You'll have a wood duck which will have some wood brigands with eggs. And of course, the cowbird deliberately will use her eggs in other birds' nests so that they will raise their young. Sometimes you see funny eggs in these, uh, these boxes. This is called a, a dwarf egg, a little one. It's round, it's a rough other coat. And if you need egg, egg whites, this is the egg that uh, you prefer. It has no yolk. This is a problem in the manufacturer in the female. Uh, it is infertile, it will not hatch. However, the other two, which are normal eggs, will. There are several other uh, anomalies in terms of eggs. I've also seen our wood ducks have wolf eggs here in, here in the Great Swamp. And in some cases, I've seen pictures of eggs which have two yolks, it's sort of like a peanut, or they have two shells, and they are also uh, not likely to uh, result in fertile eggs. We had over a thousand bluebird nests in the swamp in my period of time of being here. One had seven eggs. Uh, this is highly unusual. And fortunately, uh, this nest was in our nest camp. So one could see that there were two females. They would be in there fighting each other to, uh, to uh, brood the eggs. And uh, these eggs did hatch. Uh, there's only one male. The female, probably related, they're probably siblings or perhaps mother, daughter or something. Somehow they even allowed another, another uh, female to be in there. Timing of bluebird egg laying. Bluebirds can lay eggs in the Great Swamp in March and all the way to the end of July. This has nothing to do with climate change. I did all sorts of statistical analysis. When they start is purely due to the weather and the weather is much more variable than the degree or two that you get with climate change. So this year, for example, our peak hasn't come yet, so our peak is going to be in May. You hear the peak is usually in uh, the last week in April. Because of the cold weather and the wind, uh, we do have some uh, early bluebirds that are laying eggs, but nowhere near the, the amount that we would normally expect. From this graph, you can see that bluebirds have, uh, I tried to have 
Okay. And to serve through clutches. This is the main one that you see starting in the middle of uh, middle of April to the middle of May. And then there's a second peak down here at the end of June. Eggs are laid in between maybe bluebirds that are young and gotten off to a late start, or bluebirds that have lost their first nest and renested. So if you're a bluebird nest box monitor, you have a long season. You start in April and go all the way through through the July until your last uh, nest has uh, fledged once a week. Tom Gula is one of the people now who is a, a monitor. And uh, we have four other people. Okay, how eggs become bluebirds? Only one egg per day until the clutch is complete. So if you come to a box and you see it's got three eggs, and the next week it has five eggs, you know when they started, when the first egg was laid. The eggs remain viable at lower temperatures, as long as it's 70, 80 degrees. Brooding starts after all the eggs are laid. The temperature of the egg is about the same temperature as our body temperature, 98 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Only the female and the bluebird, I mean, this is what bluebirds, uh, bruise the eggs because the female has what they call a brood patch. If you would pick up a female during breeding season, and turn it over, you can spread the feathers on the belly and you get the skin. And the skin is what they use to contact the egg, a very efficient way of maintaining the egg's temperature and reheating the egg. The eggs hatch in 14 days. The hatchlings are naked, i.e. it's bare skin, no, no, no down, no feathers. And the hatchlings spread in about 19 days. Uh, also, the bluebirds tend to feed their young for two weeks after they fledge. So this delays their second nesting. That's why in New Jersey, we only get two bluebird nestings. If one would go down to South Carolina, you usually have three because of the longer breeding season. In case you have any questions, this is not a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a common term. I show this because the way bluebirds uh, eggs become uh, is quite different from some other animals, okay, some other birds. This is a turn, the, the nested colonies on the coastal islands or, or coastal shores. Uh, they defend each other. They, if you walk into a turn nest, they go up in the air and they come down and they attack you. And they'll actually hit you, unlike the these ones. So, the way the, uh, the term works is that the, they lay one egg every other day, usually three eggs, and they brew the eggs immediately. Okay, so that, that first egg is going to hatch. That's the furry one you see on the uh, left-hand side. Uh, the wet one there is just five minutes so, you know, About five minutes, it'll, it'll dry up. And the third one hasn't hatched. Turns uh, feed their young with uh, sand eels, little fish, and what have you. And as any fisherman knows, some days uh, you catch a lot of fish, and some days you go fishing and catch nothing. So the idea here is the turn is going to be sure that if it's limited in the amount of food it gets, the first, the first uh, chick is going to survive. It's going to get the food. If it gets more, there's a possibility for the second and the third. So uh, they're not putting um, all their resources into, uh, into the general population the way a bluebird would. Now let's add a, that bird that's a wet there that just come out of the shell. You can actually bird, you can actually bend that bird. It's I will not get any bigger. So you can you come out of the shell, it's wet, you can bend it and, and it'll keep it bent. This is not for bluebirds, tree swallows, or most birds. Henry David Thoreau from uh, Walden Pond. Uh, he was an admirer of bluebirds. The bluebird carries the sky on his back. This is a female bluebird uh, brooding their young. Usually they'll, they'll leave as you approach or when you open a box, but evidently it was necessary for this female to stay there to, to get the eggs, eggs warm. Ignore that somebody <laughs> just logged on and they have a moral. Okay. 
Uh, Cornell, I used to send in all our Bluebird data to the to Cornell, and they did a study on Bluebird. So they sent me uh, several uh, data recorders about the size of a dime. They record a temperature every five minutes. Wow. So you put one inside the box and one at the side of the nest. They weren't measuring the temperature of the eggs because they, they weren't on the eggs, they were on the nest, but you could see what was happening. And if you look at the uh, sort of pinkish reddish one, that's the temperature, the ambient temperature inside the box. And it goes to the usual day night temperature sequence that we see. And the, and the uh, little blue ones are what's on the side of the nest. What's sort of interesting is you can see the female bluebird only does the brooding. Leaves the nest about 7 a.m. every morning, one, two, three mornings. And that's her longest stay outside of the box. And in a period of time, say between uh, 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. where there's very little movement, the female is sleeping. And then during the other daytime temperatures, uh, the female may decide to leave the box to get some food and come back in, and, but always maintaining a, a short gap so they can keep the temperature of the eggs similar. I know that they lay the eggs in the morning. I don't know whether they lay the egg before or after they leave for that long period of time. And the Cornell study, which I saw, didn't, didn't address that issue either. If you open enough boxes and look enough eggs, Eureka. <laughs> so here you get the moment of a uh, bluebird hatching. You can see it has a egg shell which cuts that circular egg around the shell so it can get out. What's interesting is that the head always comes out the rounder head of the egg. The egg is a rounder egg in a little bit. It's not as dramatic in a bluebird as it is in the turn, but uh, that's the way it works. And you can see it's naked. It has no, no feathering whatsoever. And I show this because here's one's hatched and the question is, well, where's the eggshell? Uh, the female will come in or even the male and remove the eggshell as soon as the, the uh, hatchling is free of it. The females will uh, eat them to uh, recycle the, uh, the calcium to uh, the second, second brood or what have you. Since they, uh, yeah. and they want to get away from, away from the nest because of the, uh, have some odor which would be attracted by a uh, predator. Ah. This is an adult male carrying one of its favorite uh, bits of food for the young, a caterpillar. The bluebird likes the time when their young hatch that there's green leaves in the oak trees because the oaks are the ones that have the most uh, caterpillars that they can feed their young. If there's no oak trees, it's likely those young aren't going to make it because they won't get enough food. And of course, at this age, this is a maybe three, three year old, three day old hatchling. At this point in time, they're all mouths and stomachs. If you pick one up, you got a big stomach, they got the mouth. And that gate, uh, this one appears to still be, still be blind. And from above, as Tom says, you can, See how many uh, young there are by counting the beaks, one, two, three, four. And when the adult comes to the nest hole, they're going to put that uh, butter food they have in that one escaping the most. <laughs> Typically, all of the young are the same size. As they get older, the uh, bluebird can bring in bigger prey. This is a Katie did. That's going to go down one of those hatchlings. It will take some time, but it'll eventually go down. <laughs> and and uh, this is probably why the uh, early uh, farmers, colonists in America loved bluebirds. They didn't have pesticides, but they had bluebirds and other things that uh, consumed a lot of uh, uh, crop eating insects. These are bluebird hatchlings, which uh, are getting pretty close to fledging. The interesting thing here is their uh, plumage is quite different than the adult. They have spots on their back, they have spots on their stomach, and blue is limited to the edges of their uh, wings or their tails. In this way, they're uh, less attractive to a predator, okay? 
although, and they obviously aren't gonna be able to fly as well as an adult as they come out of that box. That being said, I've seen some remarkable maiden fights of birds that come out of that box. And, ooh, ooh, some of them come out and drop right away. <laughs> but they'll eventually get it. Okay, what is this? This is a bluebird nest where four or five eggs were laid, they hatched, they fledged. And it's hard to tell that happened looking at that. It's amazingly clean. And the reason is the adults, when they bring in food, they also take out fecal material. So that no fecal material is allowed in the nest to uh, build up and decompose and what have you. Uh, that being said, uh, we adopt the policy of when they, uh, the clutch has fledged, we will remove, we remove the nest uh, to prevent uh, blowflies from getting in there and uh, perhaps uh, predating the second, the second clutch. With three swallows, there's no doubt you've got to remove the nest, it's awful. Here's an example of an adult bluebird feeding the young outside the nest and he's feeding them a uh, mealworm. I don't have any personal knowledge, but I understand that if you want to feed mealworms to bluebirds, you gotta start with fresh ones, new ones, live ones. And then you switch over to the, uh, whatever these are, dried, what have you. This was taken by uh, Steve Byland. He was the first guy that, that uh, did the bluebirds. He has since passed, but he was a uh, nature photographer. Okay, here we have uh, three uh, fledglings sitting on their native box. I first saw it on YouTube, but these, uh, these fledglings will come and help raise, uh, bring food to the, the, second, uh, the second nesting, sort of a practice on becoming a parent or a mother. Uh, they all have dark rings, but they're not all female because that's the uh, image of plumage. Ah, of course, this is a newly born uh, bluebird or tree swallow. Uh, I didn't take it out of the nest. It was given to me by the uh, Raptor Trust, which is surrounded by the Great Swamp. And occasionally somebody will bring in bluebirds or tree swallows this size. It's very, very difficult for a human being to spend the time and effort to raise this thing. So when they get these, they call us up and we find a box that has bluebird hatchlings about the same size. And we put one or two in a box. You come back a week later and it's still there and it's the same size as all the other ones. And uh, they're very successful in taking these orphan, orphan uh, birds and raising them. I don't know if they realize they have an extra, extra young or they don't care, but they do a nice job. Once we put the we were desperate. We put two into a box where we knew the eggs were going to hatch soon. They survived, the eggs hatched, and they all made it. Uh, if one dies, it's usually because we got it so late that uh, there was no hope. Ah, here's our 20 year record of uh, bluebird and tree swallow fledglings. Uh, if one looks at the left hand side, you can see that it's predominated by tree swallows, the red, uh, the red uh, columns and the bluebirds were certainly, uh, it was more of a tree swallow trail than a bluebird trail. As a result of pairing boxes and also spreading them out, uh, we got to a period where it's probably equal between bluebirds and tree swallows. And then recently, one can forget about uh, 2020, we were not allowed to look at our boxes from the middle of March and the middle of June. So we're missing a lot of data. So that, that's a, just in there for records, but it doesn't really reflect what happened. But you can see there was a definite uh, fall down in the number of bluebirds as you go from uh, say 17 to, uh, to 19. This coincided with a great increase in the number of house friends that nested in the swamp. You cannot reduce the house wren population by flooding an area with boxes. You'll just get more house wrens. And uh, 
at that particular point in time, our friends across the uh, Passaic River. What's the name of that park? Lord Sterling oh, Park. They had a tremendous number of uh, house friend boxes. They were producing house friends and we were getting some of the uh, uh, impact of that. Okay, tree swallows prefer wetlands. They feed on flying insects. So they're very comfortable being close to bluebirds because they feed in the air, the bluebirds on the ground. And of course, they seek, seek any area that has, has water, swamps, marshes, lakes, nest in open areas near water, and are less common in the upper uplands of the refuge. This is the uplands, as opposed to uh, down near where all the uh, dams are in water. This is an adult tree swallow. Notice how long their, uh, their wings are versus their tail. That's because they spend an awful lot of time in the air. Uh, some people mis mistake these as bluebirds because they do have a blue tint in the air. Typically, a tree swallow clutches six eggs, five or six white eggs, more oblong than a bluebird, and also have feathers. A female does not have a brood patch. Um, they have more eggs, and they tend to put these feathers around their nest, which retains heat, helps them to maintain the temperature of the eggs. I believe this is the, uh, the source of that uh, term, feathering your nest. <laughs> now, if one looks at the eggs, and the dates laid for a tree swallow is a completely different pattern than for bluebirds. And the reason is that tree swallows just strive to have one clutch per year. And if you're going to have one clutch per year, you seek the optimum time to do that. So tree swallows are arranged so that their eggs hatch at the end of June, early May. So they peak their egg laying, I guess in the next, next week, when a lot of tree swallow eggs. The ones that come after that period of time are tree swallows that uh, have had their first nest fail. And all birds, given time, and uh, uh, they will try to re-nest if their first clutch does not make it. So you see most of late in, late in May, those nests which are started in June, only 50% of them will be successful. Successful means at least one egg hatches and one egg fledges. fledges. And here's a tree swallow. You can see the egg down in the right-hand corner there, rooting its eggs. Here's another tree swallow at the entrance hole. It does have very small food in its mouth, hopefully mosquitoes or maybe gnats. And there you can see the long tail, which is a long wing, which is longer than the tail. And this one was fortunate enough to get an egret feather. You'll see turkey feathers good feathers, all sorts of feathers in these nests here. Okay, and here's again, count the, uh, count the uh, open uh, beaks, one, two, three, four, five, six, typical six. Um, again, that wide yellow gape. I think a cowbird has a red gape. That's the only one that I've seen. It doesn't have a yellow gape. And these are a little bit older. You can see, your, see their eyes. Again, a uh, tree swallow, hatchling, which is uh, getting pretty close to being fledgling. And again, the dull coloration, so that they're uh, less noticeable to uh, falcons or hawks or something that uh, feeds on birds in the, in the, in the area. Eggs in the clutch, there is a difference a number of eggs laid by a bird, depending upon the timing. The biggest uh, thing here is the red, the tree swallows. You can see that uh, it's typically on average five in May, but all the way down to three in June. That represents the fact that the amount of flying insects in May is very high. And those in June, which will hatch in, in July, there's a, a lack of food. So it made some effort to uh, realize that. The same thing can be said about bluebird. They retired or the uh, amount of animal food has decreased. There isn't much 
This is much different from the world. Bird are nest failures. I often wonder how successful bird nests are, successful in raising and fledging young. Every time I find an open bird nest, even though I walk in one direction to see it and keep on going straight, not to create a dead end, which is recommended, uh, they still seem to have an awful lot that don't make it. So having a uh, nest in a box, which you can follow, it's sort of interesting. You can see what the chances are of these uh, cavity nesting birds to actually fledge young. Now the vertical axis percent failures, uh, the opposite of that is uh, percent successes. When one looks at the average year for these uh, number of years and you see it's greater than, greater than 80%, which is a little bit better than what Cornell has for bluebirds. Uh, you can see that the biggest uh, problem with nest failure is predation. And I'll talk about that later. Next is abandonment. That is the eggs never hatch. And this is other, which is primarily dead young, dead young in the box. And there is variation. I wish 2004 had happened recently. It's amazing that year, everything must have been great. The temperature must have been not too hot, not too cold. The wet, not too hot, not too cold. All the predators happy. I mean, that was 93% success. Far better than any other year. We have avian nest box competitors and predators, i.e., they can predate the boxes and they can also uh, overtake the boxes either before or after uh, the bluebird or tree swallow has used it to lay eggs. And the two are the house wren and the house sparrow. House friends are a native species. I like house friends. You know, they're active. They, they have this uh, trilling song, which is easy to recognize. They're visible. They'll sit upon their nest box. Uh, because of the Migratory Bird Act, they cannot be destroyed. You're not allowed to stick nest uh, or other eggs out of a box. Of course, I'm sure some of you people also speed, which is also a, uh, <laughs> also a crime. They lay, uh, they lay, make nests of sticks. It's sort of interesting um, in that you have these long sticks and you say, well, how do you get that stick through the hole? And what they do is they put it in their beak and the stick goes down, down their stomach. And once they get into the box and they can arrange the stick the way they want. Unfortunately, uh, they peck open the eggs in nearby nests, even if they uh, don't tend to use that nest to destroy competition for food since they feed on the ground. I've seen them peck open bluebird and chickadee eggs. And they're a top disruptor of bluebird nesting. So not, not too much you can do, but move the box. And hopefully get to an area where they uh, uh, will not uh, bother the other boxes. Okay, you can see on the right-hand side the uh, House for a nest of sticks. It's sitting on a uh, tree swallow nest. Wow. Presumably, it displaced the tree swallow or nested after the tree swallow is finished. If the entrance hole is larger than they could get into, they will try to build the, the sticks all the way up above the hole so only they can get in and a bigger, bigger a bird cannot. These were very, very industrious friends. This is a wood duck box, probably 10 times the volume of an ordinary uh, a bluebird box. And these wrens were trying and striving to get that uh, pile of sticks above the hole. They didn't succeed, but they did nest in one of the corners. And uh, from what I could tell, they did uh, fledge, uh, fledge eggs. House wrens are known for nesting in very strange places. Uh, I guess they were desperate to use this box. And here are their eggs. They're sort of pinkish when they're first laid. They gradually turn a little bit darker. And in this case, you can see they're good housekeepers. They picked up uh, plastic uh, from around, the, uh, around their box and put it in there. Inside this thick nest is a grass cup, and that's where they lay their eggs. You can't see that by just looking at the sticks. 
And here's an example of their anti-social behavior. Uh, they will go into a box, peck open the egg, and then dump it out at the entrance hole. Uh, I once uh, came across a um, wren that had just dumped an egg out, and a female bluebird came screaming out of the trees and chased the, chased the uh, wren away. There were two eggs left, and she uh, eventually uh, fledged those two, and I guess was well aware of the house run in the area. Mm -hmm. There's a tendency of all species to go through ups and downs and cycles. And this is the period where our bluebirds didn't do so, so well because the amount of wrens that fledged from 16 through 19, 16 through 18 was way, way out of the ordinary. Uh, I feel because of the wrens that were being raised next door. A wren really takes place of a bluebird in these paired boxes. The bluebirds and wren both are feed on the ground or in local trees, the tree swallows in the air. So most of the time when you have a wren nesting, you'll be a tree swallow in the other box. I think only once I've seen simultaneously wrens and bluebirds in the boxes. Okay, house sparrows were introduced from Eurasia. Somebody decided that it would be wise to import to the United States all the birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare's writing. Both uh, house sparrows and starlings were, were the two that have caused us the greatest trouble. And of course, interfering with the nesting of these non-native species is allowed. No amnesty in this case is given to these illegal immigrants. Um, House sparrows are not a big problem here in the swamp. They build their nests in, in boxes in the refuge owning areas where they're near houses, feeders, or livestock. They don't, I don't think they put, put uh, seed in these feeders by the uh, visitor center during the summer because you don't want to feed the bears. It also keeps the house sparrows away. Uh, sparrows can displace nesting uh, tree swallows and bluebirds. They can remove eggs, they can kill adults. You're allowed to remove these nests. Uh, through trial and error, we've learned that the best way of doing this is to let the sparrow lay their eggs, let them brood them for seven to 10 days, and then remove them. Their hormones tend to change, and they won't immediately start laying eggs again. I learned that because one year I had five weeks in a row, I removed eggs and nests from the same box. And, uh, I also try to hard boil the eggs and put it back in. But then somehow they know that that egg is not viable, they lay eggs anyway. And you could try to capture the adults, but you know, that's impossible in a place like this. This is a house sparrow nest, it's sort of messy. A little bit of everything. They're spotted eggs, they have either a light green or a light blue background. Somebody in Cornell was seeking data to see if they could correlate the green or the blue with the habitat or something else. Evidently, they, I never saw any results. Maybe they gave up on the study. And here's the history of uh, house sparrows in the swamp. The average five clutches in three boxes out of 140 boxes, that's not very, very much. For year six and year 18, uh, evidently uh, we removed the clutches too soon because I kept on laying them. This is the bluebird which was killed by a house sparrow. I say that because you can see the end of this uh, wheat shaft down at the bottom, you know, a bluebird would never bring something like that into the box. And we have a lot of mammalian predators in the swamp. Uh, predator guards can stop the mice and long-tailed weasels. Flying squirrels uh, are deterred by distance from trees. They can, they can glide, but not forever. Uh, raccoons require conical predator guards. And bears can be deterred by odorants, either bleach or coffee grinds. Raccoons are very clever. I don't know why they 
put a box next to a tree, but you can see they climb up on top of the box and reach it with their, their hand. People say this is not prehensile, but I look at that hand and I say, gee, that top seat sort of looks like a thumb. They can open a doorknob. They can do a lot of things that uh, people can do with their hands. Tom, I held this raccoon while I took that picture. Yeah, he was a great guy. Okay. The, the, the raccoon was dead. <laughs> okay, here, here you can see signs of a raccoon raid. Raccoon hair uh, caught by the edge of the box there that climbed on top. And then you see the claws at the uh, side of the box. And sometimes, well, they try to get the eggs or the young, they may pull out the nest, so the nest will be pulled out through the hole. And if there's any way that they get to that box, they'll get to it. But we have them pretty much under control. And we all know that bears love bird feeders. They work on the feeders out here. This is my house. And this is bear. <laughs> I don't see him very often, uh, but uh, he enjoyed the uh, sunflower seeds I had in this, uh, in this uh, feeder on the window. And there's no doubt what took that uh, bluebird box down. That was a bear. They'll knock it to the ground. They prefer eating at eating at ground level. And this is our number of bear predations that we measured for years. And suddenly became a problem uh, here in the teens. And uh, somebody raised the question, isn't there anything you do about them? And, she was a graduate of the Chicago, University of Chicago Business School, and she says, I'm going to research it. Well, when she came back, the next day was six, six, six ways we could do it. Five of them were, we knew weren't going to work. We said, the bear has this great nose. So if you can do something, okay, that will uh, make them uh, discouraged by the odor, leave it alone. And she was right. So we used bleach, and then we went to uh, coffee grinds. Unfortunately, in 2020, we weren't here, and uh, the bears came back. Well, we'll take care of it again because we know there is a solution. This is the ultimate uh, predator system we have. We, that brown thing around the fence post is a stovepipe guard, it prevents anything from climbing up. The garbage can lid prevents a uh, raccoon from getting to the box. And that can of uh, yingling soda down there was filled with bleach. And that presents uh, the bear from uh, wanting to go to there. Of course, as being, uh, being a leader, I had to uh, buy the beer, empty the cans, <laughs> and then put in the, uh, put in, <laughs> and then put in the bleach. I volunteer to help. We can use all sorts of volunteers. You don't have to be like the birds, you know, you can build, up, build houses. What happened? But uh, you had to keep on filling these things because it evaporated. So the, the coffee grinds are good. You can put them around and they seem to work as well. The Southern flying squirrel. These are pretty common, uh, but they're purely nocturnal. So unless you make a big effort, you're not gonna see one or unless you uh, happen to come on to where they're nesting and, uh, and uh, flush them. You can tell they're nocturnal because of the big eyes, the whiskers, and of course they have that famous membrane from the equivalent of their uh, elbow, I mean, their wrist to their, to their ankles. There's actually one on the tree, you know, a, um, in, 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 the in the exhibit room, in the map room, you can look up and see what it looks like. Because these things are like an airplane, into the wind they could actually, uh, actually elevate, but huh. they, can, they can go, uh, they can go pretty, uh, pretty fast. The first time I saw a flying squirrel was in a bluebird box. I opened it up and there it was. Oh boy, and that's a big squirrel. that's a big mouse, but it wasn't a mouse. And it was sitting beside a bluebird and it killed. So uh, and that, that that post was right next to a tree. I don't understand why what why it was put there. Sometimes in the winter, these things are about the same size as a chipmunk. Chipmunks go underground, that's how they keep warm in the winter. The flying squirrels will amass in boxes. Twice we've come across wood duck boxes that have five or six squirrels. Uh -huh. In this case, uh, 
you open the box and they tend to they tend to leave. This one got on my shoulder and Tom took the picture. But uh, not only do they prey on, on bluebirds and other other birds, but screech owls will prey on flying squirrels. And the screech owl eats everything but the tail. The tail is big and long, but doesn't have a whole lot of meat on it, I guess. These are white-footed mice. These are the only mice that seem to get into the boxes. Uh, however, the predator guards have basically eliminated them as a problem. Uh, they do get into some of the wood duck boxes because their metal posts, they rust, and they rust, they have enough to go up. And if there's a small hole, they can get in. Ah, what is this? This is the long-tailed weasel. They're terrestrial. I've only seen one. Steve Byland took this picture. They are small enough to get into a one and a half inch diameter hole and get a bluebird. I had a beautiful picture of a bluebird with his head bitten off, but the world doesn't know how many shows anymore. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are like a, like a gray squirrel on steroids. They're about the same size, the tail is a lot longer, and obviously the neck is a lot longer too. Ah, uh, and here we have our reptilian predators. This is a picture Tom made in his youth. But we have seen these in, in, in the refuge. It's, it's sort of frustrating. You come to a box that had eggs or had young, and you open it up, and it's completely empty. They didn't fledge. The snake leaves no tra the traces. This is a black racer. It's very fast, as his name suggests. It can climb. And uh, if you have a bush around where you can reach out over the predator guard and get in. Abandonment. You, you follow a nest and after three weeks, the eggs are still there, they're cold. They've been abandoned. And there's many reasons for this. Uh, one is infertile eggs or improper incubation. We had one box that for three consecutive years, they laid four eggs and never hatched. So it was clearly the same birds. And uh, clearly there was a problem with incubation or infertility. At death of a par parent during brooding, there's no way a, a one bluebird can, can raise a flight and brood the eggs and raise, raise, the, uh, raise the young. And in July, you have three swallows give up. If there's, if there's no food around, they will just leave, head for the uh, marsh, marshes along the, uh, along the coast where There'll still be lots of insects for them to live on, or flying insects. Overheated eggs will not hatch. We do have ventilation and shade presented by the uh, roof being larger than the size of the box. Bluebirds can keep their eggs warm and they can go in and out of the box to maintain the temperature. And we have ventilation. Starvation, the last major cause a failure. Nestlings grew from a small adult to actually in 19 days. They're eating machines. And if they are not fed regularly during keep growth periods, they can die. Uh, bad weather, like we're having now, could interfere. I mean, birds don't fly very well into a, into a 10, 15, 20 mile an hour wind. If it rains and visibility is poor, they can't see the prey. And that will result in, 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 uh, in dead hatchlings. I once had a box where you could see the order in which they died. The smallest, they were just like that. Wow. You can usually tell within 10 foot because the box has a distinct odor associated with a dead clutch. I don't do this myself. We have many helpers. Unfortunately, uh, I don't have one from the last year or so. But I will describe some of the volunteers. Uh, the big guy on the left is uh, Jim Mulvey. He's a real estate agent. He goes out early to check his boxes. He also does the gourds that are in the background for the Purple Martins. And he looks after our nesting eagles in terms of their progress. Next is Joe. Pronounce his last name, please. Okay, that's <laughs> Joe B. Joe B. Dr. Joe B. He was a... Uh, I guess a PhD chemist who worked for a pharmaceutical company, former uh, 
former uh, Bluebird monitor who became president, like Tom. Tom was Bluebird monitor, still is. But it's the way. It's the way, yes. The lady in the middle was Nancy Felicito. Nancy is a travel agent. She's probably the best birder. She's been all over Central and South America. She gets these perks for being a travel agent to go and test these things out. Paul Ford really wasn't too interested in birds, but his thing was building bird boxes. We can use anybody's talent who wants to participate. Uh, Paul worked for AT&T, he has passed. And this guy in the right, that's a nice picture. That's why I showed this one. <laughs> Tom has replaced Joe, you know, as our resident. Uh, President, president. president, and we have added a fifth, another uh, monitor, uh, Christine Prague. I call her. Uh, she's a grandmother who drives a uh, T-bird. Sort of interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't discount her. <laughs> and that's the end. Okay. Well, traditionally we do now, for those that are interested in, in, and we have a box out here that's pretty close that is used by bluebirds and we'll go to it. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, everybody here have any questions? And then we might have some questions online as okay. well. Okay, okay. Anybody have any questions? I have a question. What happened with the house wrens that were at the EEC? They reduced the number of boxes. They were just a number of boxes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. You might want to repeat the question to the people online. Oh, you think they did? Where's the question? The question from Tony. Oh, the question was, uh, what happened to the bluebirds over at the uh, Lord Sterling Park? Uh, Pete uh, started following the bluebirds over there, and he reduced the number of uh, Boxes they have and that reduces the wren population. Did that impact the bluebirds here? Oh yeah, because if you were blue, the house wren went down, so the bluebirds population uh, increased the number of number of boxes they were able to use because they basically replaced the bluebirds in the two box system. Other question. How did you place the coffee grounds? How would that how would that uh, just around the base? Okay, on the ground. Yeah, just okay. around the base. Yep. Those two different blue birds there, what what's that like? Well the left hand side is the uh, is the uh, tree swallow. Oh the tree swallow, right. And the right hand side is the uh, male blue bird. Other questions. Sometimes yeah. when there's one box, there's swallows and bluebirds both. Yes. Showing up there. So, how do you know who's it is? Well, they're, 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 they're competing for the box. One species will win the box. But the other one still kind of hangs around. The other one's going to have to find, well, not if they expect to breed in anytime soon. <laughs> and that, that happens, and sometimes the bluebirds win. Some, the tree swallows, are, they, seem, they seem to outnumber them, and I don't understand why, but you have two bluebirds fighting five or six tree swallows. Mm -hmm. And the relationship among the trees. Well, likewise, if you're inspecting the boxes and the tree swallow nest, there'll be more than three, two tree swallows that'll come down and die above you. Know, that'll be you know, getting four or five. The bluebirds we see in the winter time, do we think that the same birds that live here year round? Well, they're partial migrants, they may be ones that come down north. Same way with the robins. There's robins here in the winter. They probably come down north and the ones here go south. Get it food. If they have food, they'll stay. Yeah. So I did that here. Does anybody on Zoom have any questions? I have a question. I I had a I built a blue box um, with the Audubon Center up in Burnsville this year, and I put it up in my backyard. Um, I have a pretty big lot. It's 50 by 200 and um, not too many trees, pretty open. I put it way in the back um, and I wanted to see if it's okay to put another box up, just like what you were saying about the wrens versus the bluebirds. Um, maybe thinking about putting another one up next year, but I wasn't sure how far away to put them. 
So Kathy, Leo, Tom, can you hear Terry? Yes, yes I heard it. Okay. Okay. The rules we put two boxes. This is so that both a bluebird and a tree swallow can uh, find a nesting uh, nesting box. If you're going to put a second box up, uh, you'll still only get one bluebird. Um, I'm not sure if you'll have any more success in getting a bluebird if you have two boxes uh, that close together. Your 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 hope is to get a, a wren and a bluebird, or your hope is just to get a bluebird. I'd like to get a bluebird, but I think looking at the box now, I I think a um, a wren has I think a tree swallow has moved in. So the one I I did get, I think a tree swallow is in there and not a bluebird. But I've seen <laughs> bluebirds in my in my backyard. I'm not sure where they're nesting, but I've seen them come and go. Well, if, if, if you have tree swallows then having two boxes on post, maybe 15 to 30 feet apart, uh, would, would provide a, a, a good spot for a bluebird and a tree swallow. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoom? So we, we really thank, I'm going to pull this down here a little bit, um, we thank Leo for all you do all year round, you know, and getting the, the Bluebird boxes ready and monitoring and, and the reports he writes are incredible and, and he writes articles as well for our Swamp Scene newsletter. And we have a little something for you to share with your wife on Mother's Day here. So thank you very, very much. Oh, okay. It's been delightful. Uh, thank you. Also, um, when you come to the refuge, make sure you look for those paired boxes and realize all the, the work that goes into monitoring, establishing the trail, maintaining it, and we thank all the monitors that help Leo uh, also. So thank you. It's been a wonderful second Sunday. We hope to see all of you in June. And we are now going out to look for bluebirds. So uh, wish us all. Enjoy. Take care. Bye-bye.